but if you keep your session live and active and you come back to viz.crc.pit.edu, you're going to be able to see your session here. So you can rejoin a session. Now it is noted, it would be great not to leave your sessions up indefinitely because there are limited numbers of seats available on this node. Um, so, you know, if you're going to be gone for half a day or a day, okay, that's fine. Just don't leave this up indefinitely. So does that answer your question sufficiently, Josh? Uh, I think that was my question, but oh, yeah. Perfect. perfect. It sounded a lot like Josh and um trying to play this by uh play this by ear. So my sincerest apologies. Um okay, so let's just refresh. Now, once you are connected to Viz, you are going to have your session, we'll come up to our mate terminal. And within here, we will define or input module load ANSYS, which allows us to access the suite of ANSYS products. And the first thing we're going to do is launch ISM CFD. ISM CFD, um, as mentioned, is a meshing program. It's, it's not horrible. Um, I like it because you have complete control over what you're able to do. Now, recall in our meshing process, we need to define points. And from our points, we define lines. And from lines, we define surfaces. The surfaces are what covers the mesh. Um, that allows us to apply our boundary conditions. Now, what's unique about Fluent is we can do a purely two-dimensional mesh. <clears throat> that is, we only have to draw a two-dimensional representation of our system. And Fluent will take it to a unit depth. Later on, if we use CFX, for us to do a 2D mesh, we have to make a three-dimensional mesh. And there are differences. So let us first begin by constructing our points. Now, the first thing really that we should check is what are our units within the system? We can specify them. I'm gonna put these in as meters because that's what our solver is going to take. So under geometry tab on the top left, I'm gonna click the first icon, create points. And recall, we wanna use our explicit coordinates based upon our X, Y, and Z locations. Now for homework two, you are going to analyze the transient behavior of a slab. It's going to be a one-dimensional system and the slab is 40 centimeters long. Now we don't care about the height of the slab because um, we're going to assume it's just infinite and we have constant temperature boundaries on the side. So I'm first going to put a point at the origin and then I'm going to assume that the 40 centimeters is in the x direction. So I'm going to click apply again and note how in our dialog box it tells us we created points. Now I'm going to make our top of our box 0 0.04 meters tall or four centimeters. And I'll come back and create the remaining point. <clears throat> so we have the four points that define our domain. And in your window, you can control and center click to pan and then use your mouse wheel to zoom in. Now note, when we did this, our parts were created underneath a default part called geometry, which we see in our part tree. <clears throat> now, a thing we have to keep in mind is when we create our surfaces, and our curves um, within Fluent, the specification of unique lines that are going to represent boundary conditions don't mean anything. That is to say there is no impetus for us to uniquely label components in a two-dimensional mesh. So what I'll do is when I define the curve by coming to the second icon under our geometry tab, and I will select the from points, I will allow inherent geometry to remain. So I will come down, select two points in sequence, center click to accept, move over, center click to accept, move over, center click to accept, move over, center click to accept. All of this is now within our geometry part and that's okay. I will show you how influent for us to break down our unique locations for us to apply our boundary conditions. Next, we have to put a surface that covers our geometry. And the third icon under a geometry tab will be the create surface. And we'll come down and select the first icon, a simple surface. It says select curves. So we'll select four curves in a sequence, center click to accept. Currently, it looks like it drew two additional lines. That's just the representation. If we come up to our geometry tab, right click surface, we can select solid. And it's my preference, and it might not be yours, to put this as transparent. We have our geometry definition now of our slab that we can use for a problem. The next thing we have to do is put in blocking. 
Notice when we click the blocking tab, the third tab on the top of our menu, we only have one icon available, create block. <clears throat> With this, we can call this part whatever we want. It'll be a solid. And the only option we have is to create a bounding box. A bounding box, recall, specifies what entities we are going to use in the construction of our blocks. So what we're going to do is right next to the entities um, entry, we're going to select the icon that has an arrow over a brown block. And we're going to highlight and select the entirety of our geometry. We will center click to accept. Notice how our line colors have changed. And under our part tree, blocking is available. <clears throat> we have a block. Now this is a bounding block. This isn't very useful for us. So the last icon under our blocking tab on the top of the toolbar is delete blocks. We are going to delete the block we just put in. That's OK. For if we come back to the first icon, create block, we now have the ability to create more blocks. And the type of block we want to create is a <clears throat> 2D planar block. It's a planar system. So we're going to move to the second icon that says create a block from vertices faces. And it says select four corner vertices. Note a vertex is defined at the corner of a block. We need vertices to define blocks, but vertices aren't defined until we have a block. So to get around this, we are going to right click and I'll say select four locations from the screen. And recall, <clears throat> there is a particular method for the creation of your block. It's a Z. If you see here, and I'm going to right click and make this solid, I made a block. It doesn't look like a block, right? It looks like some abstract art. So recall we go in the Z formation. And by the Z formation, I'll do top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. Center click to accept. We have our block. Now the block doesn't fill the entirety of our surface. If you want it to, under the part tree, we can right click and we can say no shrink. And that will show us our block filling the entirety of our domain. Now we have a block. All we have to do is put down our mesh parameters. So the fifth icon from the right under our blocking tab is going to be our pre-mesh parameters. And we will center click the edge parameters. The dialog box says select our edge of a block. And we'll do that. Now, within the homework assignment, I think you are said to have 10, 20, 40, 80, 160 control volumes. I'm going to do the maximum. So I'm going to specify 161 nodes, which gives us 160 control volumes. Our mesh law by a geometric means they're going to be evenly spaced. And I'm going to come down here to copy parameters and say to all parallel edges. I'll click apply. And if we zoom in, you can see all the little red hash marks that are going to represent our basically the faces of our control volumes, our divisions. Now all we have to do, is going to actually turn blocks off, is construct a pre-mesh. So under our part tree, we click pre-mesh. And this is the representation of what our mesh is going to look like. Nice and easy. I'm going to right click and then convert this to an unstructured mesh. This process actually builds the mesh. Our pre-mesh, we can't do anything with. It's purely a representation of what our mesh is going to look like. There we go, we have a mesh. Now, to make sure our mesh is good, there's a few things we have to check within Fluent. So we're gonna go up to the fourth tab and click Edit Mesh, and then we're gonna come down to the third icon, Check Mesh. There's a bunch of default possible problems and errors. What I'm gonna do is select Uncovered Faces and Surface Orientations. I'm gonna click Apply. Now it's going to say, our mesh elements are uncovered. That is, the surface that we put down over a block isn't covering our mesh. That's OK. We can click Fix, and we can put them into a part. I'm going to put those into Geometry. Now our mesh elements are covered. Sometimes this error occurs. Sometimes it doesn't. It's not too much of a worry. If you are making a three-dimensional mesh, 
Sometimes it does show you which elements are uncovered and you can actually see that your surface isn't properly covering the entirety of your domain. And then you can take necessary remedial actions. Now we're ready to take this into Fluent. We will go to our output mesh tab, come to the first icon, which is a red toolbox, and we'll select our solver, Nancy's Fluent. Then what I'm going to do is file and save this project. Now, I want to put this in a sensible location because later we'll be taking this to CRC using a Swarm file. And I'm going to have to transfer this from our location to the ZFS1 directory. So I'm going to come down and I'm going to go to homework two. Hmm, it doesn't want me to. Okay, I'm just going to save it in a default directory under my name. And it's saved as project two. And that's okay. Now, I will write our input file. Our input file will ask us to pull a .uns, our blocking file, which we saved. And this dialog box comes up. We want to make sure that for this particular problem, we have this set as a 2D problem. And we are done. We have our mesh. So that was a very fast recap of what we did last class. But for a two-dimensional mesh, it's relatively easy. And that follows the steps we have outlined on our getting started with ANSYS ISIM in Fluent PDF. Now we're ready to take this into Fluent. So what I'm going to do is start a new mate terminal. Module load ANSYS, we'll load ANSYS up. I'm going to type Fluent. <clears throat> and we have our Fluent Launcher, a standalone platform. Now there's a few things that we can select. First is our dimension. We're going to have a 2D problem and we want to use double precision. Now for this type of problem, we can run serial. We don't need a parallel solver. It's such a small problem. We don't need to pull multiple cores. Additionally, we want to make sure that we have our proper working directory where we have our mesh file saved. And now we have ANSYS Fluent launched. So the way this works is on our left-hand side, we have basically a part tree that tells us everything that we need to set up. The part tree is also represented along the top via toolbars. So there's always two ways to purchase an ANSYS. I like using the part tree because we can follow it as we move down the progression of setting up our case file. So the first thing we need to do is file, read, and we want to select a mesh. Now we'll notice that hopefully we are in the working directory where we saved our mesh file. And our mesh file for Fluent has a .msh extension. We're going to click OK. Now, what's incredibly nice is just like ISIM, there is an output window that tells us what's going on. It told us it's reading the mesh. We have a total of 322 nodes, a total of 160 cells. Wonderful. And on this top toolbar under setting up domain, we have the option to display our mesh. And if we click this button, it wants us to say, do we want to display our nodes, our edges, faces, or partitions? I'll put nodes and edges. And I'm also going to select geometry and int solid. Int means interior. And I will click display. Oh, nodes look a little messy. I'll turn those off. And you can also change the color of the mesh that you would like. But with that, we can come to our display window and actually take a peek at our mesh. And that's what it's going to look like. Now, something I always like to do is you can go to info to see how much memory this is taking. Fortunately, not much at all, which is nice. It's a very small model. And then we can click the check button. 
Now the check button doesn't do too much for us. It's not going to tell us if our mesh is good or bad. Fluent in that respect only tells us if our mesh is bad when the model doesn't run. And it's somewhat frustrating because you don't know if it's if you set up the model incorrectly or the mesh is wrong. That's why I recommend when we go through this, at first we're going to do a really simple problem. We're just going to make sure it runs without doing anything fancy, and then we'll build up model complexity. But the purpose of this check mesh is to actually check our domain size, right? We want this to be 40 centimeters. So our x coordinate, our minimum dimension is zero meters, and our max is 0 0.4 meters. That means it's 40 centimeters in the x direction. This is what we want. OK, if not, you have the ability to scale your mesh. You can come up and click Scale. And you can specify a scaling factor, or you can specify the units you want it to be in. So it's easy to change it with Influent if we do something incorrectly with an ISA. <clears throat> so thus far, that's how we read in our mesh. Now, let us uh, progress down our part tree. The first thing we want to consider is our model setup. So we've already checked it, and we've already displayed it. Next thing we want to do is select the type of model we want to run. And in this situation, we're going to run a transient model. We want to look at the time evolution of our temperature. So we'll click transient. Next, we'll move down the part tree to models. We want to turn on the energy equation. This is actually going to allow us to solve for enthalpy. And then it expresses temperature based upon enthalpy. So the energy equation with Influent is cast in terms of enthalpy, unlike what we've been doing thus far, where it's cast in terms of temperature. Now, what's really neat is there's a lot of different models that you can use with Influent. For now, we're going to focus on some pretty basic stuff, our energy model. Next, we're going to come down to materials. For our solid, we can use predefined aluminum. If we double click this, we have our Create Edit Materials dialog box come up. And I'm going to make a new material. It's going to be a solid. And for this particular problem, in homework two, we want a situation where alpha squared is equal to unity. And alpha squared is going to be the term that's representing our thermal diffusivity. In that particular situation, for us to have a thermal diffusivity of unity, we will set all our constants to unity. If we click Change Create and overwrite aluminum, we can select yes. And we can close this. Now, if we come back to our part tree, we now have a material under our solid definition. It's called homework two, where we define our density, our specific heat, our thermal conductivity, well as constants. If anyone's interested, there are a variety of ways to define your material properties, if it's a piecewise linear function, a piecewise polynomial function, or user-defined. And I can post a user-defined scale or manual and some examples up to the course in the event that you want to define your own polynomial expressions in C um, that then can be imported into Fluent um, to define you know, any property of interest. But for now, we're going to work with constants. So thus far, really, we brought in our mesh, we set up our solver, we picked our model, made sure energy was on, and we selected our materials. Now we're ready to actually begin to apply our boundary conditions. So if we go to cell zone conditions, first we'll make sure that our material, which was named a default, uh, default solid, is going to be assigned homework two. Now the fun part, our boundary conditions. And you might notice under the boundary conditions that we have geometry. Everything is defined as one. So for us to actually have unique boundary conditions, we're going to have to come up to the zones region. 
and we're going to separate our faces based upon an angle. Now I'm going to separate geometry. And in doing such, we notice we have geometry, geometry 002, 003, and 007. And what we're going to have to do is determine which of these unique geometries is now representing a unique boundary condition. So within here, right, go and separate faces, and we select an angle. Don't select face, otherwise it's going to make, ooh, a very large number of faces. Um, we broke up our curves, so we're defining the boundaries of our surface where our boundary conditions are applied. So what I'm going to do is come up to the display button. I'm going to deselect everything. I'm first going to turn on geometry and geometry 002. We see this is the top and bottom curve that represented our domain. If I look at 03 and 07, those are our left and right hand side boundaries. OK, so I know geometry and 02 are going to represent our adiabatic boundary conditions. Now I can come and apply boundary conditions. So under our boundary condition folder, we will double click geometry wall. And note we have thermal available. Now for us to have an adiabatic boundary condition, we wanna make sure heat flux is selected. We're gonna have a zero heat flux and zero heat generation rate. I'll click okay. Geometry 002 is also going to be a zero heat flux condition. Those are specified. I'll click OK. Now, 003 and 007 are going to represent our constant temperature boundary conditions in this problem. So we come down and specify our temperature. In this problem, we want a temperature of zero degrees centigrade or 273.15 Kelvin. I'll click OK. And I'll do the same for geometry 007. Thermal temperature will be selected, and we're going to have our temperature of 273.15. So now we have all our boundary conditions specified. We're set up. Our model's set up. There's nothing too much more complicated than that. The only thing we now have to consider is initialization of a temperature, setting up our solver controls, and getting a solution. So under our solution tab, we have a few things to go through. And let's take a look at each of these menus to kind of explain what's going on. So under methods, we have a method for our pressure velocity coupling, which we're going to talk about in this class. We're going to go over the simple algorithm. However, we don't have flow. So this is not needed. Now, when we talk about spatial discretization, this is going to talk about the discretization scheme used when we are casting our constitutive equations in a finite volume formulation. Now, the one that we're concerned about is our energy equation. And right now, these are set purely really for a flow solver. Um, so you'd have a first order upwind scheme, which we'll talk about in class, as well as our second order upwind scheme. Um, what we can do, really the selection of these is irrelevant, but I'll just select first order upwind. Um, we will get later into the expert parameters to control some of these discretization schemes and open up the entirety of the menu of available schemes, um, which Fluent actually doesn't show you in this user dropdown menu. But the other thing that we're going to be concerned about is our transient formulation. And we're going to use a first order implicit scheme because this will be a transient problem. So we'll set up those methods. Everything else really doesn't matter because it's going to be applicable to fluid flow, which we don't have. Under controls is where you can set up your relaxation factors that we talked about previously. And we'll set energy equal to unity. It's a default. Now, under monitors, we can double click residual. And the residual we want to track 
is energy. We don't care about continuity, X or Y velocity because, well, we don't have fluid flow. So we will have monitor selected for energy as well as convergence. And here you can specify your convergence criteria. I'll see if we can hit one e to minus 10. Now you can do your convergence criteria if you want absolute uh, residual or relative residual defined. We will go with absolute. We've talked about uh, our definition of residuals before. We'll click OK. Now, we have just a few remaining items before we actually get to run this. First and foremost, what I'm going to do is go to File, Write, In Case. In case I mess something up, we're getting to the point where we put a little bit of time into this problem. And I want to make sure if I mess it up and accidentally have fluid commit a segmentation fault, that all that's for naught. Um, so I highly recommend saving fluent at intermediate stages. Because um, even if we initialize our domain and fluent throws a seg fault, our case is done. We can't save it. We got to scrap it and start over. Fluent's the best. Um, I'll show you guys some cases I built. If, you know, I can show you some meshes where we have close to 6,000 blocks representing hundreds of unique domains um, with thousands of unique definitions um, you know, that took months to build. And there's nothing more fun, you know, spending an entire day uh, for a fluent to throw a seg fault because you set your energy under relaxation factor to 0 0.9 and you lose all your work. So please, please save often. Um, fluent is a great solver. It's just a little finicky up front. Um, the old adage, you can't get something for nothing. So we're almost ready to solve this. And as you guys have seen in your problems, right, you have to initialize your domain. Now, um, let me do something. Class is taught. Uh, I've been referencing homework too. I don't know if you guys actually took a look at it, but this is one thing that we'll actually have to consider for our second homework assignment. Um, that you're considering heat conduction in a rod. We're only considering one dimension with the length of the 40 centimeters where the ends at X is equal to zero and L are kept at zero degrees centigrade. Um, alpha squared is equal to unity. Um, but our initial temperature distribution is T is equal to X. That is, we have a linear temperature distribution. That's important because if we come to initialization where we specify temperatures within our system, um, we see that we can come down and we can specify a uniform temperature. If we hit initialize, that initializes our domain but we don't have any provision for a temperature as a function of position. And what I mean is we initialize our temperature to 273.15. That is going to put 273.15 at all nodal values. That is to say, if I come down here and we look at our mesh, I came down to results, graphics, contours, selected temperature, and I'm going to come to probe. I'll select here. We get a temperature of 273.15. We'll come here, temperature of 273.15. You go, huh, I really want that linear temperature distribution. Now, there's two ways to do this. One, um, which is my preferred method, because it relies on a bastardized version of C and then linking a C file to Fluent, either as a compiled or interpreted um, document that requires the use of some header definitions, um, AKA a user-defined scalar. Um, it, it's great, it's robust. However, that has a bit of a learning curve. Um, 
But there's another way. And this way is called a field function. Field functions are really the stripped down version of having user defined scalars. So what we're going to do is we want to define a field function that specifies our temperature, right? So our temperature is going to be 273.15. times the quantity. And what I'm going to do is select mesh and x coordinate times 100. And this is going to be a custom function. When x is equal to 0, our temperature is going to be 273.15. Whoops, that should have been a plus. Uh -huh, my bad. I got carried away plus x times 100. Now, when x is equal to 0 0.4, 0 0.4 times 100 is 40. We add that on, that should be 313.15. So that's going to give us our linear temperature distribution. So I'm going to define this. And we can call it uh, linear temperature distribution. I'll click the define button. Now, the reason why I went down that particular path is because under initialization, we saw we could provide a constant temperature 273.15, or we can come down and patch this. What I'm going to do is patch temperature using a field function of our linear temperature distribution to the zone called solid. I'm going to click the patch button and close. And now, if I come back to my contour, we have our linear temperature distribution. This is going to be our initialization. This is going to be the first temperature within our solution. And if my math serves correctly, if I click here, we got 273.275. And you might say, okay, that's not 273.15, but I have to note that this is applying the temperature at our cell center. So X cannot be equal to zero for our cell center by the way this is set up. So this temperature that we're probing on the far left face is actually gonna be representative of the temperature of our cell center of that cell. If I come to the right, as opposed to having 313.15, we're getting about 311.035. And there's gonna be a little more on the end of it. So those, those values are going to represent our initial temperature distribution, which is pretty nice. Now, um, I'm going to go slightly out of order. We want to go down to run calculation. Now, under run calculation, we can check a few things. First, you can say check case. Higher order discretization schemes for, you know, the solution will improve your accuracy. Yeah. I agree, but we're going to do first order accurate because that's kind of what our code set up as. Uh, you want to be able to compare apple to apples. The next you can see is your time stepping method. Since we have a transient problem, we have to pick our delta t. And this is something that you guys are going to have to figure out, right? What is the time step that we need for stability of our solver? And you guys can do the back of the hand calculation. For now, I'm going to put in a value of one millisecond. And if I'm going to let this calculate for a second, I need 1,000 time steps. Now, the max iterations per time step. This is how many inner loop iterations that we are able to do until we have spatial convergence before we advance our time step. And this is something that you guys kind of have to play with. Um, sometimes you put too few and you don't get spatial convergence before you advance your time step. Sometimes you just put too many and you're never hitting your specified residual criteria. That is, you're just going to iterate a thousand times over and then you're going to hit the limit and you're going to advance your time step. So it's a trade off. And when you guys build and run models, this is something you kind of have to test and feel out to really fine tune it in. I'm going to set this to 50. Now, in the homework, it asks us you know, to determine the temperature distribution for 5, 10, 15, 20, 40, 80, 160, 240 seconds. So if we're going for 240 seconds, 
we'd actually need our number of time steps to be 240,000. A decent number. And more importantly is you're going to want to save your data at intervals. Right? I'd probably pick an interval of five seconds. So under calculation activities, we can actually come up and say auto save. And how many time steps? Well, for a one millisecond delta T, if we save every 5,000 time steps, we're saving it every five seconds. And if you come in and click edit, you can specify you know, what you want to call it, all that stuff on the output. I'm going to do one time step just for the sake of us being able to get a solution and post-process this. So with that, I'm going to write it once more in case this fails. And I click Calculate down our run calculation. And as Professor Gibby always says, this is where you pray. You just hope it works. I'm afraid to click this button because I did this like four times today. Three out of four was just a seg fault. Fourth time, it just worked. It was, <laughs> it was a random lottery. Oh, fluent. Okay, it's going. Look at that. So what we see is it's plotting our energy residuals. And we're actually coming down and hitting our 1 e to minus 10, which is great. So what this guy outputs incredibly quickly. Now, I don't like fluent's output. Uh, because we just can't really see what's going on very well. Um, but it tells you your iteration. It tells you the residual for um, your quantity of interest, which is going to be energy. And then it tells you that it moved on to next time step and what your current time step is. Now, what's more amazing is at first we had very high residuals as we moved through a time step. But those residuals are dropping down. That is, it's now converging at every time step with a very few number of spatial iterations. Right, we need spatial convergence before we can move forward temporally. Look at that go. Now, based upon my material property settings, I might have a bogus solution. Um, for the sheer fact that we might have just now hit a uniform temperature of 273.15 throughout our domain and we didn't capture anything fun. But we'll find out ever so shortly. So it's okay for us to prototype here, but next class I'm going to show you actually how to run stuff on CRC, where we can do this in parallel using some really fast processors, such that when you submit your job, uh, it'll be done probably, you know, faster than you can say Baker Mayfield is the best quarterback in the AFC. But for now, I'll just end this. If it lets me, which it doesn't look like it will. Uh, but we should be nearing the end of our solution. Now, it's going to be important for us to actually use our SORM files on more powerful nodes such that we get a solution quicker. All right, the maximum number of iterations that we could achieve is 50,000. Um, we're at 1,400, but it should end momentarily. All right, our calculation is complete. Wonderful. Now, we can look at our results within. Yep, it went too far. So what I'm gonna do here is reinitialize. I'm going to run this a lot shorter. Patch it with our initial temperature distribution. And for us just to see what's going on, I'm going to set this down to 10. I'll show you how we save this. 
Beautiful. There is our temperature distribution. Now, this will show us our temperature distribution with Influent. Um, and we can also plot. But I'm going to take this to another software that's much easier to use, gives you better pictures, allows you to do a whole, whole bunch more. So for us to do that, what we're going to do is file, and we're going to write our case and data. Because we need a .dat file. And we've completed everything we need from Fluent. Now, what I'm going to do is bring up one more mate terminal. And if I remember correctly, CFD post, all one word. So CFD post is another ANSYS product that allows us to post process really any CFD file. Um, I'm a big fan of this software because we can build expressions and that allows us to do a lot of calculations on the data we already have, which is great because sometimes you want to take values at cells and you know execute stuff on them and get some information. Initially, it just looks nicer. You can really control how you want to export pictures. You can make really, really high definition pictures. So what we're going to do is file, and we're going to load our results. Now we just have to make sure that we are in the same working directory of where we saved our fluent files. So we're going to come down to homework2.dat. That is fluent's proprietary data file. I'm going to click open. Hey, there's our bar. Look at that. Now, what's cool about this is that we could have workshops just on post. We could have, we could basically spend half a semester just doing ISM alone. Um, it's fed half a semester just going through everything Fluent has to offer and how to use it. And we could probably spend another half a semester talking about posts and everything great that it has. Um, but I don't know if you guys want to spend three semesters with me just talking about some ANSYS products. So first thing we want to do and that everyone's most concerned about is making a contour. So we'll click the contour button, which looks like a heat map. And what we want to do is put our contour. Now I'm just going to select the entirety of our domain because that's nice and easy. And the thing of interest is going to be our temperature. We click apply. There is our temperature distribution. Now you might say, Dr. Barry, you did something wrong. No, no, no. Because uh, with that linear temperature distribution, we're going to see it's going to be you know a little warmer on the right than it is to the left. Now that's our temperature distribution, but that doesn't allow us to compare anything to your code. So I'm actually going to turn our contour off. And what we can do is insert some really cool features that allows us to extract data at various points. So what I'm going to do is click Insert, Location, and we're going to click a line. Let's call this line one. Now we're going to put the line through uh, the center of the box where we can pull our cell center values. So recall our height was four centimeters. So we're going to put this 0 0.02 in the y and 0 0.4 in the x. So point one is our x, y, z coordinates. This is our x, y, z coordinates. of our line. And if we rotate through, we see we have a line right in the center of the box. Now, what I'm going to do is put this to 161 samples, because that's going to allow us to really define the line um, through our domain. I don't know why it's not showing. Oh, no, that should be 0. All right. So that, that's a line that goes through our domain that's going to be picking up all our cell center values. Um, and the reason why we have this line is what we can do is insert a chart. And a chart will allow us to extract these values, plot it, and export it to CSV data that we can compare directly to our own in-house code. So under the chart, what we want is an XY line. And 
this is pretty easy to set up because we can select our data series and our location is going to come from line one. I'm going to click apply. It's going to yell at me and that's okay. But I want to make sure that everything we input is accepted. Our X axis is going to be X, our axial location. And our Y axis, we are going to select temperature. So we're going to click apply. And there we have our temperature distribution for those 160 control volumes. Now, what's even more amazing is not the fact that we can look at this on a screen, but we can export this to a CSV file. This is something that we can pull down using WinSCP. And now you have CSV data that you can read in MATLAB and compare directly to your own in-house code. I'll click save. And we got our CSV data. Now let's minimize this. And let me take a look. You got your X location and your temperatures. Which is fantastic that we can compare directly against to what you guys obtained from your code. So I know that was a little bit quick. It took us about a little under an hour to get through, but that's the gist of the meshing process, getting into ANSYS Fluent and setting things up for a simple diffusion problem such as this and specifying a non-uniform initialization, running our code as well as getting um, our results post-processed and put in a form that we can use and interpret. A crash course, as you may say. <laughs>